we are in Revelation chapter 2. And I know maybe some of you guys are thinking at the pace we're doing this, uh, we won't possibly get through Revelation before the Lord returns. We'll see. But uh, <laughs> we'll try not to drag it out too long here. Um, but what we are looking at here is uh, the letter to the church in Smyrna. We'll be picking up in verse 8 today. And this is the second letter that we see written to of the churches. And uh, this would be... Um, the church that was the persecuted church. And if we were looking at this from the point of view as this uh, fitting a period of time in church history, it would be the period from uh, 100 A.D. to 312 A.D. Now, what happens in 312 A.D. that makes the persecution stop is essentially you have uh, Christianity become the state religion of Rome. And so the persecution stops, which creates a, a whole nother set of problems, which we'll cover in the coming weeks. But uh, we're not, we won't go there just yet. <clears throat> now, the city Smyrna is in Turkey. It's uh, modern day Izmir. Uh, it's about 35 miles north of Ephesus. It was destroyed in 600 BC uh, by Eliates of Lydia. And it lay desolate for 300 years. So as, as it uh, laid there, uh, you know, it was just the city of ruins. Now you think about it, 300 years in our way of looking at it is a very long period of time. That exceeds the history of the United States of America. So it's, it's quite a long period of time. Now, um, if we look at it in terms of uh, Middle East and how they view history, um, it's not as long because there are cities that, that are older than our country. Now, um, Lysimachus, we talked about him a little bit in the Daniel study. He was one of Alexander the Great's four generals. He was one of the generals that had inherited a portion of the empire after Alexander's death. Uh, Lysimachus, uh, he inherited uh, this portion, the Lydian Empire. And when he did so, he basically brought back the city of Smyrna to life in 290 B.C. So um, by the time that uh, this letter is being written, the city is uh, approaching 400 years old in its reborn state. So um, it, was, uh, it was brought back to life. Now, the city of Smyrna became the site of the second Asian temple of Caesar worship. Now, so what that meant um, in terms of uh, how the worship was practiced is once a year, essentially, you'd have to go in. didn't matter what you practiced as far as your worship, but you could go in once a year to the temple to Caesar, and then you would take incense and you'd put a pinch of it on the altar and say, Caesar is Lord basically to swear your allegiance to Caesar, and then you walk away. You go back and worship whatever God you wanted to. You could, you could uh, worship Jehovah. You could uh, uh, be a Christian. You know, whatever it was that you wanted to worship, uh, you were allowed to do so if you would do just that one thing. Now, of course, one of the problems was Christians who believe the Bible and to believe the Word of God believe that there is only one God and they refuse to pinch the incense. So this led to a great deal of persecution. Now one of the other uh, problems that occurred for the Christians in this time was all these other temples uh, to these other gods were controlled pretty much by the trade guilds of the day. This is something we talked about with Ephesus was how these trade guilds um, would make their living from producing idols or various uh, associated support businesses that went with the worship of these temples. I mean, it was, it was tourism for them. So as their industry was hurt, they, of course, turned on the Christians. And this resulted in severe financial persecution for the Christians. They couldn't get jobs. Uh, they were put in a place of having to beg. They were in absolute destitution. 
um, it was uh, there was basically if you were a Christian if you if you believed what the Bible says if you were committed to the Lord Jesus Christ that you were going to suffer persecution that's all there was to it in this particular city now um, the other thing that happened with this though is in this time you now had the Gentile world who was desiring uh, to have nothing to do with the Christians and at the same time you had uh, unbelieving Jews who were only too happy to aid the Gentile world, the Roman world, in the persecution of the Christians. I mean, this we you see that in in Acts. Uh, you see it uh, saw it with with Jesus. How it was the it was the Pharisees, it was the religious hypocrites of the day, um, who appealed to the Roman government essentially and tried to get uh, Jesus crucified under Roman law. So this is uh, what the Christians were facing in the time. Now, the, um, if we look at this uh, letter to the church of Smyrna, there are the, the prevailing views of how we are to look at this view. There's uh, one, of course, that it's a literal church in John's day, which indeed it was. And then we also see this as the period of intense persecution of the church from 100 A.D. to 312 A.D., now, are, there are some that look at this and see 10 periods of Roman persecution of the church. Um, and uh, we'll look at that a little bit. And then there are those that see this as 10 years of persecution under Diocletian. Except one of the problems with this at the time of the persecution, and at the time that this is being written, some of the persecution of these 10 periods have already taken place in Revelation speaks of it as a yet future event. Now, the other thing we see in this letter is elements of the church that exist today, the martyred church. <clears throat> now, this letter is also very similar in theme uh, to Paul's epistle to the Philippians, which deals with the suffering, suffering of the church. Now, the name Smyrna itself means myrrh. It is, uh, you guys are familiar with it, it's a spice that's used in, in burial. Now, one of the things to uh, keep in mind with myrrh is the only way it would give off its scent is if it was crushed. Uh, it had to fall under intense pressure in order to give off its aroma. Now, when the Magi, remember when they come to worship the Christ child, they brought gold, frankincense, and in the Greek, Smyrna. When Jesus said, I thirst from the cross, he was offered wine that was mixed with Smyrna. After the crucifixion, Nicodemus, you guys remember Nicodemus? He was the one of the Pharisees who believed. He went, um, he had come to Jesus previously by night and had questions. Well, it was he who brought Smyrna for his burial. Now, the 45th Psalm uh, writes about uh, Messiah as king and his coming. And one of the things it talks about is his garments scented <clears throat> with myrrh. Now, if we were to look at the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, it says uh, that his garments are scented with Smyrna. Okay, So as we, as we look at this... Um, at Smyrna, it was something that was a, a, a soothing odor, but it's often associated with suffering and with death. It was also used as a perfume. We see it in Song of Solomon. <clears throat> Myrrh um, is associated with anointing, suffering, and the coming of the groom and of kingship. So as we, as we look at this book then, as we look at this particular church, uh, let's, let's keep this in mind about the church. And with that, let's read. Let's pick it up in verse 8 of chapter 2. And to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These things says the first and the last, who was dead and came to life. I know your works, tribulation and poverty, but you were rich. And I know 
the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested, and you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. So we see here uh, that as it starts out, these things says the first and last. And one of the things that we've talked about and will continue to point out in each of these letters is that the writer identifies himself, gives a description of himself based on things he's already said in chapter 1. And so it's, it's, it's in this way he is identifying himself um, to the church of Smyrna. And the idea here is his, that he is the first and the last shows that he has an eternal nature. The word in the Greek for first is protos, which means the very first, foremost, beginning, uh, the best or the chief. This is where we get the word like prototype. You know, a lot of times uh, the automobile manufacturers will have a prototype before the car goes into production. And so this is saying that he is the very first. And he is the last, the eschatos, the last, the farthest, the final, the uttermost. And this is where we get the word eschatology, the study of last things. So he is claiming to be the very first and the very last. And only God can make the claim that he is very first. Nothing pre-existed God. John 1, 1 through 3 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made. Now, in order to create something, you must already exist at the time you create it. So, in other words, you can't create something before you actually got here. For instance, you know, a few weeks ago I went over to Bud's shop and took a look at a car he's building, this Pinto. And as I, you know, the thing is, the car was there, but it's not Bud's Pinto until Bud does something with it. And Bud is doing something with this car. And as, as you look at this, it's like, well, it can't be Bud's Pinto if Bud hasn't been born yet, right? So one of the things... And I know this sounds elementary, but the reason that this is important um, is there are those who don't recognize this person writing as both Jesus Christ and as God eternal. And we can't really wrap our heads around it very often, God's eternity, because we're finite. We have a limited lifespan. We can't really imagine much before we were born. We can go back to our earliest memory. We can go back to our birth certificate and see the date on it. And we can really look back to, you know, you know, that point. But as far as seeing us in there, you know, we can't see anything beyond nine months before we were born because there was nothing of us before that time. But God is eternal. He has no beginning. Isaiah 46, 9 and 10 says, Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning. Now that's important because he's not saying the beginning from the end. He's saying he declared what would happen at the end from the beginning because he's eternal. And from ancient times things are not yet done, saying my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. And it's, it's, it's this one who is writing. It's God who is eternal. But then it says who was dead and came to life. Well, this is interesting as he says this, writing to Smyrna, because Smyrna was a city that laid dead for 300 years and then came to life. But the question that we have talked about a couple of times in the past weeks is when did God die and come back to life? And that's why verse 8 is such a problem for those who do not believe in the deity of Jesus Christ. 
There are those that believe that he was a created being, which is a problem because you can't create something and not exist before it. You had to have been eternal to be present at creation. So the question comes up then, does this refer to God the Father or to Jesus? So if, the, if, if this verse is speaking about God and God is speaking, he must have died at some point. If the verse is a created being speaking, he can't be the protos. He can't be the first. The only satisfactory answer, since it is Jesus that identifies himself in this, is that he is God. This is the only satisfactory answer to this. God became flesh and died on the cross and rose again as king. And there's our answer. That's the correct way to view this verse. Now the encouragement here to Smyrna is even though you die, you will rise again and will rule with them. And this is the encouragement to the church in Smyrna um, in this statement. Now, one of the things that I would like to point out is as he's writing here, this is the church in Smyrna. When we get to Laodicea, we're going to see it's the church of the Laodiceans. So it's like the Lord is looking at this and saying, well, this is the portion of the church. This is the portion of my body, the body of Christ, that is in Smyrna. And he tells them, and he starts out with the commendation. Remember we talked that there's, there's only two churches uh, that uh, don't have any condemnation, and there's only one church that doesn't have any commendation. Well, this is one of the churches that has commendation, but no condemnation. And he says, I know your works. Uh, in the Greek, the ergon, same word used for Ephesus, the, your, your labor, your business, your employment, your tasks. And he says, and I know your tribulation. And the word here for tribulation in the Greek means affliction, pressure, or crushing. It is intense pressure. It's the process that is used in order to cause myrrh to give off its fragrance. And the Lord is telling them, I know this. And you know, maybe you're here today and saying, oh great, this is going to be one of those Sundays when Tom's going to talk about persecution. You know, great, my favorite subject. I was hoping for something uplifting. Well, since we go through the Bible systematically, uh, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, um, this is where we're at. But, you know, there's some of us sometimes I think that we say, you know, can't, can't, we, just, can't we just have an I Love Jesus Bible book club? You know, I think that's what a lot of us really want out of the church, you know. But uh, 2 Timothy 3.12 says, Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. All who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. So the question you have to ask yourself is, do you desire to live godly in Christ Jesus? And if you do, don't be surprised when persecution comes. You know, I think probably most of us, if we're honest about it, say, you know, I really do desire to live godly in Christ Jesus, but can't I escape the persecution part of it? I really don't want to do that. You know, it's interesting. Um, Corey ten Boom, um, as they knew they were facing persecution, asked her father, she says, she says, Father, you know, I don't think I have the strength to endure persecution. And he said, Corey... He says, when I take you to the train station and I put you on a train, when do I give you money for the ticket? And she said, well, just before I get on the train. And he said, and if it becomes necessary, God will give you the grace to endure that when it's time. So as we look at this, you know, this is not something we have to fear because in that moment, God can give us that measure of grace to endure that persecution. Persecution is a form of pressure which bends us and tries our faith to find out what we are really made of and to strengthen us in our faith. And as he's writing here, he says, I know your poverty. And the word here means destitute, helplessness, having to resort to begging. This was the condition of the church because they couldn't get a job anywhere. Uh, the trade guilds would not uh, allow them to have a job because they weren't about to support these people that were hurting their trade. But he says, but you are rich. 
You know, and the only true riches there are are those that can endure the fire of judgment. You know, that which does not endure is wood hand stubble, according to 1 Corinthians 13. Uh, 3.13, excuse me. And nothing that this world has to offer you can really be considered true riches. It's all going to be burnt. It's all going to burn. You know what? I mean, it's the, the fire is going to judge it all. It doesn't matter what it is. You know, we like to think a lot of times that, you know, as we acquire things, as we accumulate, as we work hard to do those things, that when we die, there's going to be a U-Haul behind the hearse that goes to the grave with us. But there really isn't. I've never seen that. It's never happened to my knowledge. Um, you know, and it's crazy because, you know, there are a lot of guys that, that get buried with something. I, my brother has a, had a dear friend who passed away a number of years ago. He was always taking pictures, loved photography. They buried him with his camera. To my knowledge, the camera is still in the coffin. You know, and that's just the reality of it. It's in the ground somewhere, rusting. But he talks about this blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not. Romans 2, 28 and 29 talks about those who are and who are not Jews inwardly. And it's talking about the true Jews. Those who were not inward Jews were those who aided in the destruction of the Christians in Smyrna. They were considered, in, according to the way uh, Jesus has seen it as he writes it, these are not true Jews. They're not inward Jews. They're a synagogue of Satan. Now, don't mistake me. If you, if you, if you're, if you don't know me, I am not anti-Semitic, okay? I just want to get that on the table right away. There are inward Jews. But they're a synagogue of Satan. They were uncircumcised in their heart. And the heresies of the synagogue of Satan were these, that any church that does not preach, uh, well, any church that doesn't preach the gospel of Jesus Christ is a synagogue of Satan. Any church that denies the deity of Jesus is a synagogue of Satan. Anyone who adds to salvation the requirements of keeping portions of the law is a synagogue of Satan. The thing is, we try to do, or very often when I say we, the church is at large, very often is we try to add something to the work of salvation on the cross. You know, this was one of the things that the early church had to contend with, was as um, Gentiles started getting saved, and the Holy Spirit was being poured out on Gentiles, there was this, you know, what does, because they were seen as a sect of Judaism, the, the Jews very often were saying, now what are we going to do about these Gentiles? You know, we need, we need to get these guys circumcised if they're going to be in the, you know, in the synagogue. This is what we have to do. You know, which, of course, led to the council at Jerusalem in which, you know, they were trying to put all these requirements on uh, the Gentile Christians. And it's there that Peter stands up and he says, he says, you know, um, God showed to me that he had poured out his Holy Spirit on the Gentiles. Let's put no other burden on them other than they, they don't eat meat sacrificed to idols so that they don't cause somebody to stumble and that they abstain from sexual immorality. That was it. Didn't want to put a big burden on them. It's just don't stumble your brother. Do this in love. But the whole idea was is you can't, circumcision does not add anything to salvation. And that's what they're saying is don't try to add to the work of salvation. You can't do it. There's nothing we can add that Jesus needs. There's nothing that we can add to our salvation to make it any better or more efficient than the blood of Christ. That's all there is. And as he writes, he says, I know. You know, and these are words of comfort. Because when Jesus says, he knows, he knows. He knows thirst, hunger, fatigue, poverty, he knows what it is to be mocked, ridiculed, cursed at, spat on, rejected, threatened, blasphemed, and betrayed by his friends. He knows all these things. So, you know, if you find that you've gone through one of these things, as, as you read this, just read these two words and hang on to them. That Jesus says, I know. He knows these things. He knows them in your life. Anything that you might be going through where you have felt any of this. He knows what it is to be blindfolded and beaten by cowards. Beaten with rods and have his beard ripped out. You know, um, he's been through 
incredible horrors. He knows these things. He knows what it is to have thorns driven into a skull by a stick, to have his back ripped open by the cat of nine tails, and to have spikes driven through his feet and his wrists, and to be crucified. He knows all these things. There's nothing we can go through that he can't say, I know. He knows. Don't think that he can't possibly understand what you're going through. Because as he was hanging on the cross in agony, he still looked out and said, Father, please forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. So there is nothing that we can go through that he doesn't understand and still say to us, you need to forgive. The condemnation to this church, there is none. It's only one of two churches that nothing bad was said to. You know, the, the, the church at Smyrna wasn't struggling with its translation to use. They weren't struggling if it's okay, uh, whether or not it's okay to, to, to have a beer or to, to go eat in a bar and grill where alcohol is served. He didn't struggle over these things. The church in Smyrna didn't struggle over them. They didn't struggle with whether they should tithe on their gross or their net. None of these things were things that upset them. It didn't concern them. They simply suffered and kept off giving the soothing aroma of Jesus Christ as they were being crushed. That's the church of Smyrna. Do not fear, verse 10, any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested and you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful until death and I will give you the crown of life. You know, and he, he starts out, he says, you know, do not fear. And that's our natural tendency is to be afraid. You know, we think, you know, we like to think, especially guys, we like to think we're brave. And, you know, you hear stories of, from the battlefield of young soldiers, you know, who say, you know, they're in a foxhole or they're coming under fire and they're saying, I'm scared. And their sergeant, if he's a good sergeant, is telling them, you better be. That's what's going to keep you alive. You know, so fear is something God gives us. But at the same time here, he's telling them, don't be afraid. And that's our natural tendency. This requires something that is supernatural. And that is to put aside that fear and to trust in God. You know, and, and the thing is, we have to ask ourselves if persecution comes our way or when it comes our way. What are we afraid of? Are we afraid to die? Or are we afraid of pain? You know, and it's, 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 uh, it's interesting to find out when you talk to somebody who has had a traumatic accident, physically traumatic accident, a lot of times what happens is God in his mercy takes away from their memory what happened just before the accident and what happened just after the accident. I had a friend a number of years ago who got uh, T-boned at 60 miles an hour. He and his wife were in a pickup. She was sitting next to him. Um, they hit their heads together, um, were knocked out at the scene. She had a ruptured spleen. Um, they, uh, they both recovered completely. Um, but when we asked him, we said, Jay, what, you know, what do you remember about the accident? He says, you know, I remember, you know, we remember that we were just driving down the road and he says um, you know we remember leaving the house and we just we don't really remember much after that we don't we don't really know what happened in the accident we woke up at a hospital that's what we remember you know so there seems to be that God in those moments he takes away some of those things that we can't endure he does take them away so we really have to ask ourselves what is it we're afraid of I mean you know be honest I don't think I'm afraid to die. I think I'm afraid of pain. I don't like pain, you know. I don't enjoy it. And there's something wrong with you if you do. Um, <laughs> but he tells them, do not fear any of these things that they're about to suffer, which is going to be imprisonment, torture, and death. 
And then he says, where are we here? Verse 10, um, indeed. In other words, the word means like behold, lo, or see. You know, in other words, it's certainly going to happen. This is a certainty. And he's telling this to Smyrna, you are going to go through this. You know, this is something else that's interesting is, is how many people who have uh, had to go through persecution and God has shown them beforehand that they would go through it. And we'll look at one of these life stories in a little bit. But he says, the devil is about to throw some of you in prison. You know, and so when persecution came, it really didn't matter if the devil was behind the uniform of a Roman soldier, the robes of a lawyer, or the garments of a cleric. It's still the devil, nonetheless, when the persecution comes. And when the devil persecutes today, he often hides behind the uniform of a soldier, the suit of a lawyer, or the vestry of a cleric. That's still the way it happens today. And they were to be tested. This word tested here me. it's uh, also, if you have the King James, it says tried. And um, it actually has a metallurgical usage to it. It means to scrutinize, examine, entice, or discipline. It can mean putting pressure on something to the breaking point in order to see what it's made of. Now, um, a number of years ago, I was reading, um, I was shopping for a knife and I was looking at various reviews in knife magazines and I came across this one review for this one particular knife where they 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 uh, it had a, a particular type of steel some call it Wootz some call it uh, Damascus steel but here's the way the the blade is formed they would take a thin layer of steel and then they fold it over heat it up and forge it and then they take it fold it over, heat it up, forge it some more, and, and in this process what they end up with uh, is 500 layers of steel that are fused together by this process. In this process, the, the, uh, the blade maker can enlay certain things so the, the, the blade is distinctly recognizable as his design. Interesting thing about Damascus steel is that after it goes through this, this heating and forging process and is sharpened, it holds its edge very well. It's a, a very uh, expensive blade to form. It tends to produce a very costly and durable and sharp knife, one, one that uh, uh, has, a, has a, a great deal of usefulness to it. Now, in this review I was reading, the way they would test the steel of the blade is they would take the knife and they would drive it into a block of maple wood. Maple's extremely hard. So what they would do then is when they get the knife in there, they would take the knife and bend it till it broke on purpose. They wanted to see the deflection, the point at which it broke. But then they would also put the metal under a microscope to examine it. And what happened with this particular blade is they bent it and they couldn't break it. And they found that the blade that had been through this particular process could not be broken. And it could be bent, but it, 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 uh, it was not possible to break it. You know, and very often God puts us through this process where we're bent, we're hammered, and we're heated. And we look at it and we say, Lord, what is it you're doing to me? What are you putting me through? Why are you allowing all these things into my life? And a lot of this is just preparing us for something that he's got for us. And he, he puts us through these things so that he can form us and fashion us into the blade that he wants us to be. So we shouldn't look at, at these things when we go through these things and say, Lord, what is it you're doing to me? We should just be able to look at them and say, Lord, I don't understand what you're doing to me, I, but I'm guessing you're doing something wonderful in my life. Praise the Lord. Have your way, whatever it takes. Jeremiah chapter 20. I want to um, read from verse uh, 7 here. Am I on the right chapter? Where Jeremiah writes, O Lord, 
Am I reading from the right place? Yes. Okay. O oh Lord, you induced me, and I was persuaded. You are stronger than I and have prevailed. I am in derision daily. Everyone mocks me. For when I spoke, I cried out. I shouted violence and plunder, because the word of the Lord was made to me a reproach and a derision daily. Then I said, I will not make mention of him, nor speak any more in his name. But his word was in my heart like a burning fire. Shut up in my bones, I was weary of holding it back, and I could not. For I heard many mocking, fear on every side. Report, they say, and we will report it. All my acquaintances watched for my stumbling, saying, Perhaps he can be induced. Then we will prevail against him, and we will take our revenge on him. But the Lord is with me as, mighty, uh, as a mighty, awesome one. Therefore my persecutors will stumble and will not prevail. They will be greatly ashamed, for they will not prosper. Their everlasting confusion will never be forgotten. But, O Lord of hosts, you test the righteous and see the mind and heart. Let me see your vengeance on them, for I have pled, uh, pleaded my cause before you. So in this, as Jeremiah is writing, he's talking about this derision and this mocking and this violence, this plunder, this reproach, essentially this suffering to the point he purposed to walk away from the God. God, he says, I'm not going to speak your word anymore. But what he found was that God's word was burning in his bones, the call of the prophet to prophesy. He couldn't walk away from it. But what we see in verse 12 is the Lord tests. The word there in the Hebrew is tries, as in trying the metal, investigate, examine, to prove, or tempt. So it's essentially the same word uh, as the Greek word. And w so what is the purpose here that we're seeing of trying the righteous, testing? So, you know, this is one of the things that, that we have to look at as we look at persecution. What is the purpose of it? You know, because I think a lot of times we look at it and say, why do we even have to go through persecution? Can't we just, you know, build this thing like a business? And, but, you know, that's not how God works. You know, a number of years ago, um, I got sued um, multiple times actually and uh, here's what I learned in the process I learned a spiritual lesson God had a spiritual lesson in this for me and that is I had an, an adversary who set out to destroy me and it wasn't the plaintiff by the way it was the devil and what I found was really on trial wasn't what I did and what I didn't do it was my character that's what got tried that's what everything centered around. And what I also found in that trial is I got pushed to the breaking point in order to find out what I was made of. Where would I break? What would I found to be made of? Because it's when somebody breaks, that's when you see what they're really made of. So why does God allow this testing? Sometimes we have to see what we're made of. You know, and a lot of times we're pushed to this point to where we break and we look at it and say, oh man, I could have handled that different. Or, wow, I had this thing going on in my life and in my character that I really didn't know was there. So sometimes God has to allow these things in our life. You know, and it's amazing what happens because when we go through these times and we learn these things and God puts them before us to deal with these things in our life and we change, they're changed. And guess what? We come out the other side having a stronger walk and a closer walk with the Lord than we had before. So very often when we go through these things, it's for our benefit. You know, it's hard to look at these things, I think, and say, wow, how's this going to make me feel better? You know, I mean, how's this going to benefit me? How, how can this be good? Well, just be patient. Let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. But he says you will have pers or you will have tribulation ten days. Now there's a lot of speculation about what these ten days are. Uh, one is that there are these ten periods of Roman persecution, uh, beginning with Nero, uh, Domitian, Trajan, Marcus Aurelius, Severus, Maximus, uh, Decius, Valerian, Aurelian, and Diocletian. There are some that say that there are ten years of persecution under Diocletian. We can speculate all we want. Here's what we know. And that, that uh, this number 10 deals with completion. And the thing we can look forward to is there's not 11. 
There's 10. There's a point at which it ends. It will come to an end. So there is a time when it does end. And that, of course, is when the Lord returns uh, as King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and he executes judgment. And that's when it ends. And the counsel that the church of Smyrna is given is to be faithful unto death. So what this is saying is the test that you are going under or undergoing or may go through or one that may come may not end until you die. So testing is going to be part of life in this life. We will have testing. As we look at this as a period or as a, a segment of the church, we can look at the martyred church. Um, the pastor at this church, the church of Smyrna, um, at this time, is a man named Polycarp. He's a disciple of John. So as John is penning this letter, you know, he first one was Ephesus. He's going, wow, I was there. That was my church. Now he's writing down the next one. He's like, oh, good. You know, this is, this is Polycarp. This is my disciple I'm writing to. And as he's writing to Polycarp, or this letter, I mean, he knows it's, it's being addressed to Polycarp in Smyrna. Now, what happens is Polycarp ends up being martyred in Smyrna around 156 A.D., now, some believe that Polycarp was somewhere in his 90s, possibly as old as 100 years old at the time of his martyrdom. Now, uh, J.B. Lightfoot translated uh, a letter that was circulating concerning the martyrdom of Polycarp. It was such an encouragement to the church uh, that it emboldened others to be willing to die for their faith. Now, I've paraphrased it a little bit here to make it a little bit more readable. But uh, the letter goes something like this. Blessed, therefore, and noble are the martyrdoms which have taken place according to the will of God. For it behooves us to be very scrupulous and to assign to God the power over all things. For who could fail to admire their nobleness and patient endurance and loyalty to the master? Seeing then when they were so torn by lashes that the mechanisms, that is the muscles, tendons, and bones of their flesh was visible even as far as the inward veins and arteries they endured patiently so that the very bystanders had pity and wept while they themselves reached such a pitch of bravery that none of them uttered a cry or a groan thus showing to us all that at the hour the martyrs of Christ being tortured were absent from the flesh or rather that the Lord was standing by and conversing with them and giving heed unto the grace of Christ, they had no fear of the tortures of this world, purchasing at the cost of one hour a release from eternal punishment. And they found the fire of their inhumane torturers cold, for they set before their eyes the escape from the eternal fire, which is never quenched. While with the eyes of their heart they gazed upon the good things which are reserved for those that endure patiently, Things which neither ear hath heard, nor eye hath seen, neither have they entered into the heart of man, but were shown by the Lord to them, for they no were, were no longer men, but angels already. And in like manner, all those that were condemned to the wild beasts endured fearful punishments, being made to lie on sharp shells and buffeted with other forms of manifold tortures, that the devil might, if possible, by the persistence of the punishment, bring them to a denial, for he tried many wiles against them. In the case of Polycarp, basically what happened is, uh, as people were being killed in the Colosseums, uh, a cry arose in one of the Colosseums, bring Polycarp. So basically what happened is they go get Polycarp, and the first thing they do is they say, well, because here's this guy who, you know, was, was the bishop in the city, and it had lived his life for Christ, they took him and they said, Polycarp, all you have to do is pinch incense in the temple of Caesar, you'll get your libellus, your license, and you can go back to your way of life. And everybody loved Polycarp. Nobody really wanted to see Polycarp die. But he said, I won't do it. 
He says, I, my Lord has been, I've served him faithfully 84 years. Shall I deny him now? And so he wouldn't do it. So they go, they put out arrest warrants for Polycarp. Um, God had showed him that he was going to be arrested and, and burned at the stake. So when they went to get Polycarp, when they finally caught up with him, he had already had a table prepared for his captors. And they came in, he fed them, he prayed for two hours, and then they took him away. And when they took him into the arena, um, they told him, you know, Parley, Polycarp, renounce your faith and, you know, swear your allegiance to Caesar. And he said he wouldn't do it. So then they told him, say, Polycarp, say, away with the atheists, which was what they called the Christians. The polytheists called them atheists. And Polycarp looked around the, the, the Colosseum and he said, away with all these atheists. And so they took him and they built the, the, the pyre to burn him at the stake. And as, as they put him on and they were going to tie him, he says, you don't have to tie me because I won't walk away from the flame. God has already shown me that I would die this way. And so they tied him anyway. And according uh, to tradition, as they lit the fire, there appeared this dome over him, which he was untouched by the flames. And so when the flames died down, somebody ru rushed in with a dagger and, and, uh, and killed him or, or stabbed him. And now according to the tradition, there was so much blood that came out, it put out the flames. And when it did, there was, uh, they, they had to rebuild the pyre, relight the fire, and when they did it, it filled the place with smoke, and it was like the aroma of incense. Now, that's tradition. But this is the kind of martyrdom, and the effect it had was it emboldened others to endure the same. Um, I want to read something uh, from one of my favorite books. You guys have heard me quote Jesus Freaks before. Uh, but it's, uh, of, it's called A Burnt Offering, and it's uh, about a man named Philip in the Sudan in, in the mid-90s. It says, The guards picked up a burning log from the fire. <clears throat> Renounce your faith in Jesus Christ, they commanded. We will burn you and cut you until you become a Muslim. Philip had been taken to a military barracks along with 35 other Christians. Islamic officials began to beat them and curse them. For 11 days, Philip and several of his friends were bound, beaten, and burned as government soldiers tried to convert them to the Islamic faith. None of the 12 women survived the torture. Philip still bears the scars on his chest left by the burning log used to torture him. He later told reporters, My faith was very strong when they burned me. I prayed, God, I will never forget you. I refused to be a Muslim because I knew God was with me. 2 Timothy 3.12 tells us that those who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. And one of the things that we have to remember is that in this world, we will suffer persecution. And in this world, we are aliens and strangers. And the promise that is given in Revelation is that they would receive the crown of life. Matthew 5.10 says, Blessed are those who who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Verse 11, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. So one of the things that we have to keep in mind is that the church is a fellowship of suffering. You can't have a fellowship of suffering without suffering. And you can't have a fellowship of suffering without fellowship. So the thing that we need to do as we live in these times and times where I think if the Lord tarries, many of us will see and will experience persecution as we look at the political climate change in our country and, and the, the Christian roots of our nation being abandoned. And the thing is that we have to remember is that we too may become part of this fellowship through suffering. And um, I just want to close with a couple of things from Philippians. Uh, Philippians 1.29 says, um, For to you it has been granted on behalf of Christ not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake. 
And then in Philippians 3.8. Yet indeed, I also count all things loss for the excellent knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. So how do we... How do we become part of the fellowship of suffering? Well, we have fellowship. And we, as those around us suffer, whether it's persecution or just trials, tough things going through life, is to be a fellowship, is to be together, to be with one another.